of the state of California. Welcome to sunny San Francisco. Um, for those who come to JP Morgan every year, you know this is the time where we get all our rain, so thank you for bringing it. Uh, this year you brought three, or three months, or three years worth of rain in one month, so thanks for that. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about CERM. We're a unique fund in California and um, how we support the discovery and development and commercialization of cell and gene therapies and regenerative medicine in general. So um, we always start off with our mission. Uh, we're a very mission-driven organization, and it's to accelerate world-class science to deliver transformative regenerative medicine treatments in an equitable manner to a diverse California and world. This is more of a paragraph, and I'll explain why it is what it is. Um, but to, to talk a little bit about the history of CERM, uh, so we were started by the people of California and are funded by the people of California. So in 2004, Proposition 71 was passed, which gave CERM $3 billion to advance stem cell-based treatments to the clinic. In uh, 2020, an additional $5.5 billion was approved by the state of California voters for CERM, and that also allows us to fund gene therapy at this point. So we are patient-centric, funded by patients and the citizens of California, and we respond to them. So with that in mind, um, I'll explain a little bit of our uh, what we fund. So we devote our funding across five pillars. Um, we support therapeutic development, device and diagnostic development, as well as tool development from discovery through clinical stages. That's where the bulk of our money goes. But we also have supporting programs in education. We support the training of students from high school all the way through clinical fellows in careers in stem cells and regenerative medicine. And we also have an infrastructure program where we have previously supported the build out of labs more recently. It's around more um, uh, strategic infrastructure around clinical trial um, sites as well as manufacturing. And I'll get into some of those things in a little bit. So over the course of uh, the years that CERM has been around, um, we have supported over 1,100. As at the moment, it's about 1,300 um, awards. 86 clinical trials have been funded by CERM and we treated about 3,200 patients and more. Uh, and CERM funded programs have gone on to raise $23 billion in industry commitments. Uh, so these could be startups, they could be acquisitions, IPOs, uh, all of those, and I'll describe some of those instances in a little bit. So to give you an idea as to the 86 clinical trials, uh, these span across all therapeutic areas, and since we primarily fund cell and gene therapies, they're concentrated in areas where cell and gene therapies have first uh, been developed. So these include blood disorders, cancer, as well as some neuro indications. And I'll give a couple of examples of the clinical trials we supported later on. At the moment, we're operating on our five-year strategic plan, and this is where our mission comes into play. So we advance world-class science, and we want to do that in a collaborative manner that encourages uh, knowledge and resource sharing. So that's going to be our aim for the next five years, to facilitate those types of funding opportunities and to build the infrastructure around that to do so. Uh, since we are very much focused on accelerating treatments to patients, we're trying to overcome the bottlenecks um, that are currently faced by the industry in regenerative medicine. These include things such as regulatory, manufacturing, and commercialization bottlenecks, and so we're addressing all of those areas through our funding opportunities. And lastly, we want to create an opportunity for access for all patients to these types of therapies as well as for workforce development for the people of California. So now to get to the points that matter to the audience here is what do we fund and how do we do it? So we have a series of funding mechanisms that span from discovery through clinical, and the idea is that a project can come in at the appropriate stage and then progress uh, to the next rounds of funding. So this is our annual allocation for new awards. Uh, so this was the numbers for 2021-2022. Uh, so in total, it's about $328 million. Uh, this has gone up to about $350 million this year. These are new awards that we give out every single year. Uh, and so, uh, as you can see, about half of that is preclinical, and the other half is clinical focused. And I'll talk a little bit about the award sizes in a little bit. It's all project focused as well, so keep that in mind. But we are supporting across the entire spectrum. So. How often do we uh, have solicitations? So our clinical program accepts applications on a rolling submission basis every month. An application that is successful can go from submission 
to approval in three months. And it can go from submission to having that first payment in hand in four months. So basically it's relatively fast, uh, probably in time with other investor opportunities and much faster than other funding opportunities that you know of. And so that was done by design. We do not want to be the ones who are holding up the treatment of patients. The earlier stage opportunities, as you may expect, have slower uh, uh, timelines, but even then, they can go from submission to having an indication of whether it's gonna be funded or not within about three or four months. So um, I'm gonna go through these three programs a little bit, give you an idea as to how we fund them, where the amounts, uh, and then how they progress from one stage to the next. So starting off with discovery, this is our earliest stage. So we have two different mechanisms here. The first is basic biology. Uh, this is kind of a catch-all funding opportunity. It can support tool development. It can support target identification, some basic stem cell research. Uh, and the idea here is to have some of that research inform um, candidate discovery down the road. And so with that, it's about a million dollars uh, per award. Uh, and on top of that, there's indirects and facilities, uh, so this is direct cost. On the disc two, this is our candidate discovery mechanism. So this, the idea here is at the end of a discovery to award, you have declared a candidate with some sort of disease modifying activity in a relevant model. It could be in vitro or in vivo, and, and then you can progress that candidate to development. And so here, for a therapeutic candidate, it's about $1.5 million. So this is somewhat analogous to uh, phase one, two SBIR type of award, um, and uh, it can fund up to 36 months. And so once you've gotten that award and um, you've declared a candidate, the next stage is translational. So this is the prototypical translational value of death. We'll fund projects to get to a pre-IND or a pre-IDE meeting and to conduct that meeting with CERN funding as well. So here we support everything from uh, therapeutics, diagnostics, devices, and tools. Uh, and the amounts can range anywhere from $1 million to $4 million. And so I'm going to take a moment here um, to pause and talk about what type of modalities we actually fund. So as I said earlier on, we're a stem cell agency. Um, but at this point, we have actually funded all significant therapeutic modalities. So from small molecules of biologics that act on endogenous stem progenitor cells to cell therapies that have some sort of stem cell basis. They could be either derived from stem cells or could be stem cells or all and every single type of gene therapy possible. So this includes gene-modified cell therapies, it includes in vivo gene therapies, uh, mRNA, ASO, all of that is covered under our funding mechanisms at this point. So the intent with the translational program is to get you to having conducted a successful pre-IND meeting. Um, for a therapeutic candidate, which is cell and gene therapy, you can get $4 million to do that. Um, per award, per project. Uh, so several grantees in, in CIRM's network have multiple awards for multiple projects, and that's very common. So from that point on, you have conducted your pre-IND meeting. It's time for the next stage of awards from CIRM. And this is where our clinical stage portfolio comes into play. So we have two clinical funding opportunities. The first gets you from having um, conducted that pre-IND meeting uh, to uh, having your IND filed. So this is all the IND enabling activities and manufacturing to get you ready for that clinical trial. And here you can get either four or six million dollars depending on the organization. Uh, and the intent here is that um, you could use CERM funding, but you may also have other funding sources that can come into play. And once you've had your IND, um, then it's time for the clinical two awards. Um, this is our flagship program, the biggest award sizes. So for a first in human trial, it could be $8 million or $12 million. Um, for every subsequent trial, it's $15 million awards. Uh, we just recently awarded Angiocrine Biosciences, a company in California, a $15 million award for a pivotal uh, clinical trial for a cell therapy. And that's pretty common for us to do. So um, that's the range of our, our funding opportunities from discovery through clinical trials. And the award sizes range anywhere from $2 million to $15 million per project per award. And I'll talk a little bit about how some companies have used our funding to go through that entire pathway from discovery through clinical trials uh, in a second. Prior to that, I just want to give an indication as to what happens once people get CERM funding. So once they've gotten CERM funding, and as you've noted, we're de-risking the development of cell and gene therapies in regenerative medicine, and so they're able to attract additional industry investments. So to date, we track that. Um, We've uh, enabled the spin out of 50 companies from academic projects that CERM has supported. 
Um, over 50% of our clinical uh, funded clinical trial projects are partnered with industry. That ranges from venture to uh, licensing and so on. Six portfolio companies have gone public. Four were acquired. Uh, the biggest one of that is 47, acquired by Gilead. So CERMED actually funded the development and the first clinical trial for the lead candidate. So in total, uh, about $23.4 billion have flowed into CERM funded projects after CERM money had come in. Uh, and like I said, it ranges um, across the whole spectrum. And as you can see from our little arrow here, um, it basically tracks with the, uh, the growing interest in cell and gene therapies over the last five years. So I want to give a couple of examples of how companies in particular have used our CERM funding. Uh, the first one is an example of a company called JSight. So this started off at UC Irvine by Dr. Henry Klassen. Um, the, the product here is a stem cell derived cell therapy for ret retinitis pigmentosa. And so it's injected into the eye. Um, Dr. Klassen used CERM funding to develop, the, to discover and develop the candidate at UC Irvine. The company was spun out um, at the time of the clinical trial, and the company itself received a couple of CERM awards as well for their clinical trial project. So it actually went from discovery through phase 2B clinical trials using primarily CERM funding along with some other foundation funding and some amount of angel funding. It was never, it never actually raised a venture round. And then in um, 2020, it struck a $252 million partnership with Santin Pharma where it Gave, um, gave Santin the ex-US licensing rights, and it's now using the upfront payment to accelerate that candidate to a BLA in the US. A more uh, prototypical example is that of Nerona. So here, um, CERM had actually funded uh, all the basic research as well as the candidate discovery and development at UCSF. Um, and so Nerona's therapy is a embryonic stem cell derived uh, interneuron precursor cell therapy for epilepsy. And um, a lot of that initial money went into validating the science, developing the candidate, and that took uh, you know, a significant amount of time. Um, and then when it came time to get to the development of that candidate, uh, the company used CERM funding, so they got a tran translational award as well as the clinical trial award recently. Um, and along the way, it's also raised $135 million in venture financing to date. So it's leveraging CERM funding to do risk the candidate and then attracting more investments along the way, but it's also continuing to tap into CERM funding as that candidate progresses forward, which is pretty common for us to see. On our website, you can find various other examples of companies that we funded and continue to fund. Um, and uh, all of our programs are ongoing right now, so we accept applications uh, at any time. So, uh, with that in mind, I want to highlight a couple of areas um, where we go beyond providing funding uh, to our grantees and the resources that we provide uh, to all of our programs. So first and foremost is um, what we do for our clinical trial as well as translational stage awards. We set up an advisory panel, uh, and it sounds um, threatening, but what it is is the collaborative effort between uh, CIRM external uh, advisors as well as the actual project team uh, to discuss progress on the award. Are there any particular bottlenecks that can be solved? Are there any major decision points that can be arrived at in, in collaboration with each other? And those are the types of things that we address uh, with these advisory panels. And so they resulted in, in improving enrollment for trials, thinking about making modifications to protocols, addressing manufacturing bottlenecks. Those are, that's been a common one that we've addressed uh, with these panels. Uh, as well as thinking about the next stages for that project. We also have a robust clinical trial network in the state of California. So initially started off with six sites, the ones that are listed on here. Uh, this quarter we're adding three new sites, um, Cedar sinai uh, Stanford, and USC, to have a total of nine clinical trial sites. And the idea here is that all nine of these sites have processes in place to rapidly start cell and gene therapy trials as well as to work with each other to expand that trial, the enrollment across the sites, um, and to, to tap into the expertise that's there across those institutions. And so the numbers there, there are a lot of numbers here, but one point that's important to know is that this network can be utilized not just by CERM funded projects, but also external projects. So it's actually supported quite a lot of industry projects that are not CERM funded. 
Um, so all the post-marketing trials for CAR-T therapies, for example, as well as a lot of early and pivotal trials across the whole spectrum of cell and gene therapy. So it's a resource that we built to benefit CERM grantees, but also the broader uh, ecosystem in California. Uh, jumping a little bit to the earlier stage, a few years ago, uh, we built uh, what today is the world's largest single connection, collection of uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells for research purposes. And the intent here was to provide a large number of cells across a few key disease areas um, for screening, um, uh, drug discovery, uh, and sort of modeling research that you can do with stem cells. Um, one of the advantages of this particular repository, uh, the two major ones that I want to highlight, the first is that it was all derived by the same conditions and the same QC. So all those lines were derived in the same way, and they had the same QC done to all of them. And so it's consistency across that. They all have uh, mass controls as well. The second thing that's relevant to this audience is that this is one of the few repositories that can be used by companies for commercial purposes. So you can use this to do research, um, to identify new candidates, um, and you can also use it to generate a uh, commercial product. And um, the, uh, the reason that we are allowed or able to do that is because the licensing has been worked out. So when you use any of these lines, you can sign up for a license that incorporates all the underlying IP, and you make the payment to a single entity uh, for that license, and you can use those lines, uh, which is something that we have not seen uh, any other repository do to date. So as you move down the translational pathway, as I'm, I'm jumping between um, translation and discovery here, so going back to translation, uh, right now one of the things that we're doing is building a manufacturing network in the state of California. And um, what we've noticed in our portfolio is that um, regardless of whether it's academic projects or companies, um, they are leveraging all of the expertise and resources at the academic GMP facilities in California. So these are cell and gene therapy manufacturing facilities at places like City of Hope, UC Davis, UCLA, and so on. And what we want to do is link that with the growing industry presence in the state of California to create a network that supports the manufacturing needs of our projects as well as external projects from that early process development to late stage manufacturing. And that is our intent with this particular opportunity. So we're committing $80 million initially uh, to this effort, starting off with first bolstering um, the capabilities as well as the partnering abilities of those academic GMP facilities and bringing in the industry partners. <clears throat> And then lastly, we do focus on the industry side of this. So we want to leverage the expertise, the resources, um, the funding of the greater biopharma industry to support the projects that we fund. So we created an industry alliance program a few years ago. These are some of our formal partners. And the intent here is that these partners help evaluate CERM funded projects for partnering opportunities. And they also provide various resources uh, to our grantees, and I'll highlight some of those in a second. But as you can see, it ranges from venture capital through uh, large biopharma, as well as some incubators, accelerators, and, and manufacturing partners uh, all in the mix. So one of the ways that we enhance this program is to focus on the resources. So the capital could take a while for them to commit, um, but resources they can provide to our grantees at a very early stage if they wanted to. So the, we're focusing initially on two main areas. The first is that when we fund um, discovery stage projects that involve stem cells, we want them to work with a stem cell line that they can rapidly progress to the clinic. So you declare a candidate with a stem cell line, it needs to be a line you can take to the clinic. And so if we're gonna make that sort of requirement, we gotta make available the lines that our, our grantees might wanna use. And so we are striking up partnerships with various different um, companies to allow access to those lines um, that are uh, in a more uniform way. So with Nova Nordisk, uh, this is our, our first one, um, was to enable our grantees to use Nova Nordisk's proprietary embryonic stem cell line for their discovery stage research and then to have a pathway uh, to commercial licensing. And those cells are available at the research stage to our grantees for free. Uh, and then there is a licensing pathway all actually spelled out in that research agreement as to what the terms might be uh, when they're ready to go to that commercial stage. Similarly, we worked with Elevate Bio, ReproCell, and iPiece to make their stem cell lines available to our grantees in a preferential manner 
um, so both in terms of cost and licensing. And on the manufacturing side, which is another major area for us, we're working with uh, Bayer, Elevate Bio Resilience, and others uh, to make their manufacturing resources more accessible to our awardees. So this spans from potentially having preferential pricing models to providing the support that um, those projects might need when they submit an application to CIRM, having that additional information to put their best foot forward when they apply to CIRM, and then to have a window into what the future needs of that project might be as it grows. <clears throat> so, and I'm gonna end with um, a slide on how we work with other funding agencies and other funding partners. Uh, so here are two examples of that uh, in how we leverage both our funding as well as federal funding. So the first was a unique partner partnership that we struck with NHLBI. So this is the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute. And both CIRM and NHLBI wanted to fund sickle cell disease gene therapies. Uh, so the intent here was to have a mechanism where we could fund clinical trials for gene therapies and sickle cell disease in a coordinated fashion. So here, projects are tapping into both CIRM funding as well as NHLBI funding. Um, they're going to uh, rapidly get those applications reviewed, and they have the same milestones um, from both agencies. Uh, and both agencies have alignment on, on funding mechanisms, the amount dispersed, and so on. So to give you an example of how this played out, um, we ha are funding the phase two clinical trial at Boston Children's Hospital um, for uh, a lentiviral-based gene therapy. The total trial cost is around 40-something million dollars. It's co-funded both by CIRM and NHLBI. And the trial sites span across the country, including several in California. And they're actually having multiple manufacturing sites as well. Another trial was a first in human CRISPR trial um, at UCSF and UCLA and UC Berkeley. And this is a $19 million trial that's being co-funded by both parties. Uh, and this one is unique because it's actually correcting the sickle cell disease mutation. On the other side of this, um, we recently joined um, the FNIH's effort to bring together various different entities to support and create a playbook for AAV-based rare disease gene therapies. So the intent here was a collaboration between NIH, FDA, and over 20 uh, private sector partners uh, to create a blue book that um, uh, basically creates a manufacturing as well as a clinical trial uh, IND uh, allowance blue book to get uh, rare disease AAV gene therapies um, to the clinic. And the intent here uh, is to have CIRM fund projects uh, along with FNIH where appropriate, and we're focusing on the California projects. So with that in mind, um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, my email is on here, so feel free to reach out. A lot of the information I presented is also on our website. Um, you could also see our entire portfolio on our website as well. Um, of active awards, as well as everything we funded in the past. And I'm um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what are the requirements you've been pleased to collect this funding, specifically your reference That's a good question. I didn't put it up here because it gets complicated. Um, so, we are California focused. I'll get that out of the way first. Um, so there is a preferential to there's a preference to fund California. So with companies um, for the discovery and translational stage programs, we will only fund California institutions. Now you could have a, a non-California company collaborate with a California investigator or a California company and have that be the grantee. For the IND enabling as well as clinical trial side, we have funded plenty of non-California companies and we will fund the portion of the activities they're doing in California. So for example, if it's um, a clinical trial, uh, we'll fund the California sites and we'll fund all the patient costs associated with those California patients, including manufacturing. Now, if you were to manufacture for your trial in California, we can fund the entirety of that manufacturing cost. So basically everything happening in California. If you're a California company, um, you can do whatever you want, wherever you want, and we'll fund it. But the preference is that you will utilize California resources as much as possible. Yeah. I just want to follow up on that question. Uh, understanding the funding the activities in California if you're an out-of-state company, but does the very fact that you're an out-of-state company sort of count preferentially in whether you do the grant? No, it does not. 
And the way we determine if it's a non-California or a California company is important to mention. So all companies are usually incorporated in Delaware, so that's not a very useful metric for us. So the way we do it is that um, number of employees paid in California. So if your company has greater than 50% of your employees paid in California, for our purposes, you're a California company. Any other questions? Thought I saw a hand go up somewhere else. Yeah. So hypothetically, a medical device that's regenerative medicine, um, and you're thinking there's some kind of stem cell response to the body itself. Do you have to verify that as part of the grant process or provide evidence of that? Or can you just show that things have regenerated from the medical studies? Yeah, so I mean, it depends on the body of evidence that you have uh, previously um, generated or others have generated to demonstrate that. And then you can use this term funding at the earlier stages to demonstrate that for your particular device. But it really depends on what the nature of that other evidence is if you don't have it yourself. And our team is very responsive and works with everyone in terms of eligibility considerations as well. All right, well, thank you very much, and, oh yeah, yeah, another one. Question, I understand sometimes during the review process you may not get feedback on why the application was approved, or is that always the case, or is that just some level of um, applications that don't have some feedback? Yeah, that's, yeah, so I'll repeat that question. The question was, um, are there instances, in, since we're a grant funding agency, you're similar to NIH, where when you submit an application, it's going to go to an external group that's going to review it based on the scientific merit, provide some feedback and, and a score, and then that's going to determine if you get funded or not. So um, the question was, are there instances where you don't get any sort of scientific feedback um, from the review? And um, yes, there is, uh, and it's only in the earlier stage, the discovery stage, where the volume of applications is relatively high for a small agency like ours. So we go through a positive selection process um, where we basically get the number down to about half of applications. So our reviewers will pick applications they want to progress to um, the full review. And so the ones that are not selected um, don't get feedback, but the ones that are selected will get feedback. So everything that goes to the review gets reviewed, but there are some that don't. And that's only for the discovery. We don't do that for translation, and we'll never do it for clinical. Do you allow resubmissions? Do they have a higher success rate? Yeah, so we do a lot of resubmissions, um, and usually it's a higher success rate if you do resubmit. Uh, we also have a process um, where, uh, for the discovery stage, where if your score is in a certain range, it'll automatically get selected to go to the full review if you resubmit, so you don't have to have the, the risk of it not being selected um, during that initial process. And for our clinical stage awards, um, the resubmission process is accelerated. Um, so the way that that works is that for the IND and clinical trial, when the reviewers give it a middle score, which is um, come back with some changes, they will specifically identify the points they want you to fix or respond to. You respond to that, it goes back to review the month after that, and, and then you go from there. Yeah. Clinical awards is a matching component for private companies. Yeah. Do you have to have that lined up before you submit, or can you think, uh, secure that after you get the Yeah, good question. So, in some of my slides, you've seen that there was a co funding section that I didn't fully elaborate on. Um, so, for translation and clinical stage awards, we want the company to put money in along with CERM. So if you say that the project is X number of dollars, um, you can request CERM funding for a percentage of that, and then you pay the other percentage. And usually, you know, we are, are, are the primary funder of that project in those instances. Um, so when you apply, you have to demonstrate that you can co-fund that project. I'll get to your question in just a second, sorry. Um, and you don't have to have all that co-funding lined up initially. Um, we expect you to have at least that first quarter of it ready to go when CERM funding is ready to go, and then you demonstrate you're going to raise the rest of it over time. Because for a clinical trial project, that could be four years. Companies are constantly fundraising. We're not going to expect you to have all that money up front. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have like matchmaking events or anything where like um, maybe some of your prior awardees or um, people that are in the translation pipeline that you can do, like either mentoring or pairing with smaller companies that are not um, necessarily yeah, so the question was, do we have any sort of matchmaking events where we um, facilitate uh, knowledge exchange and collaboration between our funded 
um, projects as well as earlier stage programs. We do um, have some of that, and we're looking to do it more effectively going forward. So we have some symposia around some of our infrastructure programs, and then we're going to have uh, hopefully more around um, our overall portfolio. Um, but we also uh, have a staff that assists all grantees with, or all applicants with questions, so you can feel to reach out to them and they'll, they'll respond as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over because I think we're at time. I'm happy to take any questions afterward. Mm -hmm.